The history of the city of Whittier on the Fred C. Nellis School is without a doubt intertwined. In fact, it has been argued that the Quaker colony established in Whittier would have failed if the school had not been built there. In May of 1887, businessman Herbie Lindley presided over the sale of lots in Southern California. His Los Angeles office was jammed with prospective buyers. The building of the Southern Pacific Railroad in the area contributed to a major, albeit short-lived, real estate boom. The Christian group known as Friends, headed by Aquila Pickering, purchased property with the dream of founding a Quaker colony on the West Coast. Pickering wrote, We could see the whole valley reaching toward the south and west until our eyes rested on the ocean. A town meeting was held on May 5, 1887. One of the top priorities was to choose a name for the new settlement, which had been simply referred to as the Quaker Colony. History attributes the suggestion of Whittier to Elizabeth Grinnell. She thought it would be an appropriate name because the renowned American poet at that time, John Greenleaf Whittier, was a Quaker. The name Whittier was unanimously adopted. In December of 1887, the real estate boom collapsed overnight. Land prices went down and lot sales ceased. Many people took what they had and left the area. Suddenly, there were no jobs to be had in the new Quaker colony. Known for their resourcefulness, however, the Friends formed the Pickering Land and Water Company, the Citrus Association, and the Quaker Brand Products. By the end of 1888, the railroad had connected through the town, and business was slowly recovering. After much controversy and discussion, in 1890, a coalition of Whittier business people, including Herbie Lindley and owners of the Pickering Land and Water Company, succeeded in convincing California to open one of the needed state reform schools for juvenile offenders in the new town of Whittier, further bolstering the town's economy. The people who came here realized that for a brand new little town, there needed to be some kind of economic um, stability and they said we'll give you some land and it became an economic uh, incubator for the town shortly after that as i understand reading the history it was they, there was a downturn and a lot of little towns that had grown up in that era in southern california um, vanished so so those who were here had great wisdom about what needed to be done to make this fledgling little town work. The development of the school coincided with the emergence of the Progressive Era, 1890 through 1920, a period where a number of social reforms concerning poverty, violence, greed, racism, and class were addressed. As more Americans moved into urban areas to work in factories and other jobs created by the economic boom of industrialization, new social programs were created. A growing concern during this period was the treatment of juvenile delinquents. In California, any minor aged 7 to 18 convicted of committing a crime was incarcerated with adult criminals in the only two California state prisons, San Quentin and Folsom. As part of the early Progressive Era reforms, advocates argued children should be housed in separate institutions. The first reform school for juvenile offenders was established by the act of the California legislature on March 11th, 1889. So Nelson was established in 1889. At the time it was called a state institution for juvenile offenders. That was the initial name, state juvenile for, for juvenile offenders. And then within a couple of years they changed the name. They wanted to sort of, you know, make it not such a harsh name. So they called it Whittier State School, which is located in Whittier, California. And so it was established because there was a real need, at least among the community and in the state, for an institution that could deal with boys and girls who essentially nobody wanted or couldn't handle anymore. The groundbreaking ceremony of the State Reform School on February 12, 1890, sparked a revival of the business climate in Whittier. The school also provided much needed jobs for local residents. The first superintendent of the school was Walter Lindley, who served between 1891 and 1894. The original cornerstone is still visible on the grounds today. The original school was designed by architect Robert Brown Young. Its design program and aesthetic reflected the contemporary thinking about the function and moral purpose of institutional buildings. 
The massive, imposing, original administration building opened its doors in 1891 to over 300 juveniles, 253 boys and 58 girls, hereafter referred to as wards. Dubbed the castle, this structure housed the reception room, administration office, school rooms, boys' dormitory rooms, the drugstore, the basement washroom, and the chapel. So in the 19th century, the first reform schools when they were first established were pretty much one big building. Everybody's inside, you know. Um, you might have different levels where people, different, they were separated by ages, but tend to, you tend to have most of the kids, the children, and, um, you know, uh, mixing with other kids. So that was like the idea of the congregate system. As early as 1892, the Whittier State School began experiencing problems associated with the lack of financial support, organization, well-developed intake regulations, and appropriate disciplinary measures that would compromise the institution's progressive ideals. Unable to secure additional funding for the institution and overwhelmed by the overcrowding and the diverse needs of wards, Walter Lindley stepped down as superintendent on October 1, 1894, after serving only three years. Following the departure of Walter Lindley, there were four superintendents between 1894 and 1912 who struggled to find a direction for the Whittier State School. Faced with a steady stream of unfavorable publicity and many years of poor reports, in 1912, the Board of Trustees appointed Los Angeles businessman Fred C. Nellis to the position of superintendent. From this point onward, the school focused upon a program of rehabilitation and re-socialization. Superintendent Nellis succeeded in correcting the problems of the past, establishing the cottage system and modernizing school administration to include innovative behavioral modification techniques and psychological studies. Well, he was part of this, what they called uh, at the time, um, uh, social reformers, the progressive movement. He was part of the, this, the young, middle-class, urban, more, mostly single, uh, pretty ed highly educated uh, group of people who were really involved in uh, leading a lot of these progressive reforms, whether it was in you know, um, in medicine and areas of education or social work. So he was part of this sort of larger group of people who were doing this kind of work. And so when he was brought into uh, Whittier, uh, at the time it was called Whittier State School, he was appointed in 1910 as an interim superintendent because the previous one, there had been a lot of problems with the institution. So they brought him in to clean up the institution. Nellis was interested in bringing about what he called um, intelligent vocational reform and to change this place. He came here and so he wanted to use the latest um, sci ways of thinking scientifically and scientific research. And so he did a lot of sort of basic things in terms of changing the, the institution. He got rid of corporal punishment. He, got, he instituted vocational training, which was about getting you know, the boys to actually learning kind of trade so that when they were done here, they can go out and get, be hired and become what he saw as um, a citizen. Dubbed the practical idealist in an age where severity, repression, and fear tactics in dealing with delinquents was expected, Fred C. Nellis was considered a revolutionary in the theory and practice of juvenile reform. That theory and practice, however, was deeply informed by eugenics, the science of better breeding, which held widespread belief in the early 20th century. As such, the benefits of these reforms came at the expense of the most marginalized boys at the Whittier State School. So the idea was that they wanted to promote um, a, a better society and how to do that. And so they promoted that through this idea of a breeding of the fit and the unfit. So this idea of negative eugenics and positive eugenics. So they wanted the positive eugenics to go on, which meant uh, promoting the marriage and reproduction of families who were seen to be fit, that seemed to be ideal um, citizens and ideal people and to promote the, I guess, the non-reproduction of people who were unfit, those who were seen to be carrying some sort of uh, what they call dysgenic traits, uh, inherited traits like characteristics uh, genetically passed down from their parents' generation to stop that. And the way to do that, the number one way to do that was to sterilize them so that they would not be allowed to reproduce. The one question that drove him all the time was like, what are the causes of delinquency? So that's what he wanted to figure out, the causes of delinquency so that they could, right, um, prevent those from happening. And so the idea was to test these boys, right, to look at their IQ tests. How do they test on the scale of normal, uh, they call it dull normal, um, and then eventually feeble-minded, moron, imbecile. I mean, they had this whole scale of where you would land on the intelligence. 
and then couple that with the social workers, essentially they were the start of social work, going into the community, into their families, evaluating the family on this. They had this very scientific chart of um, points you would get for your household, what it looked like, what your community looked like, and then they would evaluate the family members. And the idea was to go back three generations because they wanted to see if there was these dysgenic traits, who carried them in the family and how far back did that go? And did that help explain the boy? In 1913, a deadly explosion rocked the power plant. Engineers inspected the damaged buildings as well as the castle for safety. Many were condemned at this time, including the main building. The engineers believed it to be unsafe. Further inspection revealed a dangerous shortcut used on the interior walls. The builders had skimped on mortar, and many of the bricks were simply sitting loosely in their place. The boys were evacuated immediately, and demolition of the castle, with the exception of the chapel portion, began in 1916. The remainder of the castle was demolished in 1920 to make room for the implementation of cottage system, made possible in part by emergency relief money granted by the state after the explosion. The campus was redesigned and facilities were improved and expanded between 1915 and 1934. The shift from congregate system to cottage system marked a new architectural era to the school and introduced human scale architecture. The campus was distinguished by brick buildings in the Tudor revival style with English arts and crafts influences. The early 1928 plan shows this design shift with the one and two story superintendent's residence, administration building, auditorium, assistant superintendent's residence set amidst agricultural fields and landscaped open spaces. The primary buildings were situated around a central core that was accessed by two circle drives and surrounded by a park-like landscape setting. The Division of Architecture, Department of Public Works, was responsible for the design and construction of the building improvements. Construction began on a series of multi-story brick and wood Tudor Revival style cottages near the middle of the property. These family dwellings, named for U.S. presidents, each housed about 50 wards and featured well-furnished common rooms with high ceilings, large windows, and wood paneling and floors. The Tudor Revival style is one of the hallmarks of the Nellis facility, and you see behind me the superintendent's residence, which is really one of the exemplary uh, buildings of the facility. And it's set in a park-like setting. Although it's overgrown, you can see still the mature tree plantings and the garden setting around the building. This is really typical of what the various cottage residences and the other facilities here looked like. Great Tudor Revival architecture, beautiful campus-like setting. The grounds were very well maintained um, throughout the Nellis period and later. As you look around, you can see that over the years, a lot of people really cared about this place. Um, the architecture was, uh, some of it was very, uh, High, a high level. The grounds were beautifully maintained with beautiful trees and um, it seems that this is a place that uh, really should be remembered as a part of the history of Whittier and Southern California and California uh, itself. Nellis sought to make the cottage system more nearly like a traditional mother-father house concept for the young boys whose ages ranged from 8 to 16 at the time of commitment. Detailed assessments of the ward's homes were taken, noting such things as housekeeping habits of the mother and drinking and work habits of the father. As the institution's longest serving superintendent, he was part of a larger cohort and movement. He was a leader and many looked to him, but he drew upon others' ideas as well for revolutionizing the methods of the times for dealing with delinquents. He was a real leader in this juvenile reform because he was able to clean up the institution and also um, work, turn these boys around, and he did that very well. Dubbed the practical idealist in an age where severity, repression, and fear tactics in dealing with delinquents were expected, at the time, Fred C. Nellis was thought of as someone who was revolutionizing the theory of juvenile reform. Mr. Nellis laid the foundation for the Whittier State School's early years by formulating a general policy and philosophy. When he first came on board and he had all these new ideas, people uh, at the institution, the staff, administrators, were not happy. They, a lot of them quit, a lot of them left, said, you know, this is, you're going to get rid of corporal punishment, you're changing all these things, you're going to, what kind of a place is this? 
So he had, and he was happy to let them go. I said, you want to leave? This is my new policies. And so they all bolted and they said no. And so he was able to hire new people and bring these changes on board, right? So these new departments he created, um, he even established the Department of Research, which became very important to the work that he was doing. But like I guess I said, um, he also established a lot of vocational training programs for you know, the, the print shop. They already had a farm, but you know, making that a little more rigorous in terms of the kind of um, manual labor they could do in agriculture. Um, what else did they do? He had um, quite a bit of different kinds of areas where the boys can receive training. The ideal was to you know, rehabilitate them and to train them in some way. The training was limited. I mean, that most scholars will argue that it wasn't enough training to really make them professional in any way. But you know, the idea was behind most of these institutions to be self-sufficient, that they could help feed the institution, repair whatever was needed to be repaired so that the state wouldn't have to you know, subsidize the institution so much. But definitely initially, he, um, there was a lot of backlash, a lot of people writing in the paper saying, like, who is this man? What's he coddling these young boys? But eventually, he did get a lot of support. When he saw, um, people saw the changes he made, he started giving talks. He went to the community. You see the, news, the Whittier News, um, it's a newspaper at the time. You see him everywhere. And especially what was really successful is his sports program, his athletic program. So he really built it up. I mean, they were competing with um, community colleges at one level. So football was really a really central component. And there's some really wonderful pictures of the football team that he led. And that he believed that athletics was a, a, a really positive way to reform. And so then in France and Germany, they started new sort of revolutionary ideas about how to deal. Instead of having the congregate system, they thought, let's have cottages where we have smaller homes, about you know, maybe 30 um, individuals or fewer, built around this idea of the family, where you could have a house mother and a house father watching over the children so that they can have more of the feel of the family. Basically, the best knowledge available was implemented here. Um, psychologists, psychiatrists from Stanford University, from UCLA, were brought in and um, there were uh, attempts to develop better screening devices and the intelligent, the Stanford Binet uh, IQ test was at least partially developed here. I also think it might be worth remembering that a lot of films, major motion pictures, have been filmed here. Dating back to the late 20s and even in the early 30s, Mickey Rooney, Shirley Temple, a lot of the big stars were here on location. Fred C. Nellis died in 1927 while still serving as superintendent of the Whittier State School. From 1927 through 1941, Fred C. Nellis was succeeded by four superintendents who continued his rehabilitation philosophy. These superintendents focused on specific programs, such as vocational arts and the development of social skills to re-socialize and rehabilitate the boys. Mr. Nellis's most notable successor was Judge E.J. Milne from Utah. Milne was hired in 1933 and served as superintendent of Whittier State School until 1941. Milne ruled with the use of the code of silence when no one was allowed to critique the institution. In the 1930s, the admission process that Nellis had established was continued for the wards as structured as was their time spent inside. Intended to impress the boys upon arrival, this administration building was their first stop in the commitment process. There they were taken to the infirmary, examined, and quarantined for several days to prevent the spread of any contagious diseases. Once cleared, a series of aptitude and psychological tests were performed to determine their proper placement. Finally, they were assigned a cottage and a strict schedule. Earning a coveted spot in the honor cottage was a right for which to strive. Wards were sent to the lost privilege cottage for infractions such as running away or fighting. The lost privilege cottage, the closest thing to solitary confinement in existence at the school in the 1930s. In 1939, Benny Moreno was sent to the lost privilege cottage for running away and reportedly stated that he expected to get out of there soon. His body was later found hanging in his cell. The alleged suspicious circumstances surrounding the Moreno suicide spawned exhaustive investigations into possible mistreatment and endless media attention. Milne was fired, several staff were jailed, and Milne's name was forever tarnished due to his code of silence and the abuse he allowed to continue. After leadership and management issues and problems with violence at the school in the late 1930s, 
the future direction of the institution drastically shifted. In 1941, the Whittier State School was renamed the Fred C. Nellis School for Boys in honor of its pioneering superintendent. The name change would signal an end to the Nellis era. While his influence extended past his death in 1927, subsequent superintendents would fail to match his success and state-level organizations would alter the school's path from its originally intended reform vision. Additionally, the destiny of the school was tethered to a larger political issue in state politics. The combined incidences became the primary force behind the 1943 transfer of all state reform schools to the jurisdiction of the newly created California Youth Authority. Even under the umbrella of the Youth Authority, Wards continued to plot successful escapes from the Fred C. Nellis School. Country singer-songwriter Merle Haggard was admitted to Nellis in 1952 for truancy and larceny. He ran away a short time later. After the California Youth Authority were handed management of the school in 1941, values shifted and the Nellis School operated in the same capacity as other delinquency schools. The Nellis campus was demolished between 1953 and 1966 by the California Youth Authority for the construction of a new modern school. After completion, only eight buildings remained from the Nellis era. The superintendent's cottage, the auditorium, assistant superintendent's residence, the infirmary, the chapel, the maintenance garage, and the gym. The Grand English Manor cottages built during the Nellis and Milne tenures were raised and replaced with one-story brick correctional style barracks, still referred to as cottages. These cottages included Roosevelt, Cleveland, Jackson, Washington, Hayes, Kennedy, Tyler, Madison, Adams, Monroe, and Ford. The one-story brick contemporary cottages were identical and oriented around a curving road. The new buildings were typically one story in height, constructed of brick, and rendered in a modern architectural style. A new school complex was constructed between 1953 and 1962 in the northern area of the property, adjacent to the auditorium building, and consisted of four classroom buildings, a school office, a library, and a vocational building. In 1962, the original commissary that once accommodated separate ward and staff dining rooms was converted into Catholic and Protestant chapels. Eventually, wards were not allowed into the administration building that had once served to impress them upon entry, and a fence was built between the superintendent's residence, administration buildings, and the rest of the facility. The Carter-Nixon Building, which mirrored the design of adult penitentiaries, was erected in 1988. The prison-like building served to handle wards incarcerated for increasingly violent crimes, to house the sex offender treatment program, and to separate wards that were unable to socialize normally with others. Later, the school dropped the for boys portion of its name and became the Nellis School. Soon after, the Nellis School was renamed the Fred C. Nellis Youth Correction Facility. As is the case with corrections in general, it's kind of a pendulum back and forth, I think, and it has been for at least 200 years, where um, people finally, uh, after a period of time, realize that the correctional institutions, whether juvenile or adult, have kind of turned into snake pits, and so there's an attempt to reform and bring in the latest ideas, uh, psychological, social work, to make changes and then some great strides are made and then and then things kind of fall apart because generally speaking funding isn't maintained and training isn't available because of funding and the programs kind of fall apart. Life for the wards in the years that followed the raising of many of the original buildings from the Nellis era mirrored a changing attitude towards the facility's purpose. During the tenure of the California Youth Authority, The philosophies of rehabilitation and juvenile reform that were reflected in the architecture and Ward's daily life were no longer tied to the mission that Nellis had developed for the site. The drastic change in direction can be heard in the voices of former Wards. I got, as a matter of fact, on July the 28th, uh, 1952, is when I came to Nellis. And pretty soon it'll be, you see, it's some 60-some years ago. No, there was not so much of friends. Uh, you know, you had a group of boys 
And the only thing that you really learned to do, you worked in a group and as, a, as, a, as a unit. And fortunately, we had a house father, that's who we called the head supervisor of, the, of a cottage, Mr. Frank O'Connell, he had a, uh, the drill team. And every time you, the new boy would come in, he automatically became a member of the team. And then you learned to march and to perform different uh, maneuvers. And you would practice every day. And we would participate in various competitions. We'd have movies here in the auditorium on the third Sunday of the month. Because uh, as, as it is, uh, the second and fourth Sunday were for visitors. And they would visit from two to four. I was here in Francinella School for Boys in 1953 and 54. I was 13 to 14 years old when I, when I left here. I spent seven months here. You know, I remember our marching, our going to Hoover Cottage. And off of Hoover Cottage, there was big fields that had been planted. You'd wake up the same time every morning and uh, you'd go down and you'd march over to breakfast, the breakfast hall, and have your breakfast. And then you had things to do, whether it was going to school or the parade ground marching or going to the church. I would come in the evening as a volunteer and we would talk about um, how to get a job, how to fill out an application, uh, what things to say, what things not to say, what to wear. Um, and then we also talked about where they would live. What they wanted was somebody who could help them when they left Nellis. As the site changed direction under the Youth Authority, there was a noticeable decline in the upkeep of the buildings and grounds at Nellis. It was not in good condition when I was here in the 60s. I know the classroom that uh, I would teach in, uh, it would have stacked up desks that were broken in the corner and they'd be here year after year. Nobody repaired the desks to get them back in a classroom. Uh, there'd be chairs that you couldn't sit on and they'd be stacked in another place and um, those chairs were never repaired. I don't remember a building that I was in. I was just in one of the regular classrooms, but I don't remember it ever being painted, um, fixed up. Uh, they were not in good condition. I had an opportunity uh, in the late 80s, our church, I think I indicated just up Plymouth uh, Church is just up the street here. And one of the guys at the church said, you know what, the Bible talks about uh, going and seeing wid uh, widows and orphans, but also uh, visiting the prisoners. So we should go down to Nellis and we should go in there and talk to the, the wards about the Lord Jesus because they're in there for a reason. They have lots of issues and lots of problems. We started coming here to Nellis uh, almost every, basically every Monday night uh, to Hayes Cottage, which is on my way in here, it's down and around the corner. And uh, so we would go and we would have a Bible study uh, in the shower area, it's all hot and steamy. And uh, uh, the boys, the wards who wanted to um, meet with us and read about the Bible, learn about the Bible and hear from us and talk to them. And, uh, they would come and we'd meet them on Mondays. And um, I did that for almost uh, 10 years. But we were here for one reason, that was to minister to the wards and provide some male influence to them. And we found out that we became mentors to them. We all have different backgrounds, we all have issues. And so, yes, my attitude towards now has changed because these no longer were bad boys, they were people just like me, different circumstances, but they needed help like I did. I have a personal connection with Fred T. Nellis. I was a ward here uh, from 1996 to 1998. I graduated from UCLA School of Law in 2012, and I've been an attorney now for five years. Today I work with the California Department of Corrections. I work with the Division of Juvenile Justice. I work with prosecutors. I work with the governor and the legislature. You know, my role at the National Center for Youth Law, I am a juvenile justice attorney, but my focus is on ending the practice of prosecuting kids as adults. There was a lot of violence and anger in this facility. You know, the, the duration of my time here, you know, I would say pretty much the entire time was an extremely violent and tur turbulent experience. You know, as, as I understood it, you know, we had 
almost twice the design capacity in terms of our population. A lot of these young people had backgrounds in foster care. You know, they were removed from their home for many years either because of their parents' abuse or neglect or because of their own delinquent behavior. But to get here, you know, it was pretty much their last stop, you know, for many of them. And so what I saw was a lot of young people that needed more than what this environment was giving them. And I think this environment was extremely traumatizing and re-traumatizing for a lot of these kids who had experienced unthinkable you know, amounts of, of violence. You know, there was a lot of youth who were 24 years old and t two and three times my size uh, and, and seeing people as young as 12 here. Um, it was like no place I had ever been. Not to say that I'd been in very many places, but Juvenile Hall, you know, at least in, in my experience in Juvenile Hall in Ventura County, you were separated uh, or at least organized by age and, and that made, um, I think the potential for, for disaster <laughs> a, little, a little less, but to be here and, and see you know, young, young teens or preteens with adult men, um, it was scary. Every county in California had their part to play in, in, in what happened to the California Authority. Every county in, in California basically gave up on so many of their high needs youth and sent them here. And the result was a state juvenile prison system that was overwhelmed by numbers and, and, and level of need and was severely under-resourced. In, in my opinion, a lot, the system that is made up of human beings um, did not have the resources or the training and in many cases the human capacity to deal with this level of need. And what resulted from that was people, I think, kind of resorting to their most base, lowest level of humanity, which was to act out at, you know, in, in, violently out of frustration. And, and what that looked like was young people victimizing each other, the adults victimizing the young people and pretty much just a, a, an environment that was exactly the opposite of what this, this place I think was designed to be. I think Fred T. Nellis, his vision was to have a, a, a therapeutic environment where young people are, are helped along in their, in their positive development as youth. But what we had was a congregate care facility run by the Department of Corrections that had no idea how to raise young people with this level of trauma and I think oftentimes they just kind of gave in to their inability to do right and they did wrong. In response to a lawsuit concerning violent wards relegated to a 24-hour lockdown who were then unable to attend school, the state issued special program areas to the classroom. Known as SPAs, these cages protected the teachers from the wards and the wards from each other. Well, uh, that's what we called them at first was pause. The press and uh, other people called them cages. We built these spas or cages and uh, with the idea that it would pro the teachers would feel good for secure about going down there and provide education. Okay. It's one of those situations that, that made sense uh, programmatically, that not, did not make sense politically. Public outcry in the early part of this century resulted in the abandonment of the use of SPAs. Fights would happen all the time. And, uh, and the fights were not uh, necessarily one-on-one uh, -on -one fist fights where you might think could solve a problem uh, and, and where folks might shake hands afterwards and get on with it. But these are often stabbings and, and um, included other forms of very violent, very violent, violent activity here. So uh, that would often complicate things for some wards when they were looking at longer time in the penitentiary and sometimes they would be shipped to the prison earlier but otherwise would, would uh, generally serve their time out uh, to the age of 25 or be released earlier. In my case it was released when I was 19. The closure of this facility in 2004 really marked I think a moment uh, under Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, where we had reached peak boiling point. Um, and this really came from the resulting uh, lawsuits, from various abuses that were uh, taking place, uh, from the, uh, the media becoming aware of, of things that were happening to, to our youth. And, and we, were, we were beginning to be troubled um, to the point where these facilities just needed to be shut down. Right. There was no easy way to do that, and so the mechanism was put in place to shut them down. 
In the early 2000s, as we all recall, um, the, uh, the state went into a deficit. And um, the state decided to sell surplus property. This was in 2003. And the state was moving wards out of juvenile um, um, facilities and they were pushing it down to the county level. Um, so one of the areas that they were looking at closing facilities was the, the CYA, the uh, California Youth Authority. Um, and so I was in a position at that time uh, in my law practice because I spent a lot of time in Sacramento. And I know that the city had been, council had been talking about, well, what if Nellis, what if Nellis was shut down? Arnold, uh, Arnold was elected. And so uh, because of my political uh, affiliations, we were able to um, help put together a bill that essentially uh, closed out this facility and it was part of other facilities. Over the years, as the city grew up around Nellis, um, then people didn't really like to have this barbed wired gated facility in their community, in their residential community. In May 2004, the last wards were transferred out of Nellis. The wards were sent to the county level, the least offenders. The more serious ones were kept in state institutions and some likely to prisons. Finally, in December 2004, the site was closed as mandated by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who declared the Fred C. Nellis Youth Correction Facility as state surplus property. The site was sold as part of a state facility disposition strategy in 2012. At that time, the State Historic Preservation Officer reviewed the historic and architectural studies prepared for the project. None of the original Tudor Revival-style cottages had survived the renovations and upgrades of the 1950s and 60s when the facility was renovated by the Youth Authority. And in large part, most of the site development and buildings that truly reflected the precedent-setting aspects of the campus had been destroyed during that time as well. Only eight individual historic buildings still remained on the campus from the Nellis era. The gymnasium, auditorium, maintenance garage, assistant superintendent's residence, administration building, infirmary, chapel, and superintendent's residence. The other buildings and landscape features built after the Nellis era did not contribute to the site's historical significance. Four of the eight historical buildings will be rehabilitated and reused. The assistant superintendent's residence, the chapel, the administration building, and the superintendent's residence, which was the home for eight years to Fred C. Nellis and every other superintendent until its closure. Prior to demolition, Key character-defining physical features of the four remaining buildings are being made available for use on the project site or within the city of Whittier. Very happy that it's going to be converted into something that all of Whittier can use and enjoy. As an architectural historian and a historian, working on this project has been a bit bittersweet because the history of what has happened here um, has both good and bad sides to it, both emotionally difficult things to, to approach with the treatment of some of the boys and some of their histories and how, how much struggle there was here. But then also the, the real care and the um, efforts that were made to promote reform and to promote positive experiences. This is really reflected or embodied, I, for me, in the architecture and the campus because there was so much attention to detail and so, so much high quality uh, workmanship and design. It's sad to see the place redeveloped on the one hand, but I think it's really positive on the other hand and it's time for it to happen. And um, I think that the, the future is bright for the place and I'm glad that the, the history is being uh, well represented and being commemorated, which I think is important, and that we're retaining the, the most important architectural monuments, um, but it's about time for new life to come to the place. The history of California, the city of Whittier, 
the state criminal justice system, youth reform, and the buildings on the Nellis site are without a doubt intertwined. The introduction of the development's new buildings have the potential to provide otherwise intangible character to the community, as well as allowing for residents to experience historic buildings not previously accessible to the public.